from planting flowers. Somebody say amen. Planting bushes or planting whatever I, we decide to plant. I do like springtime because uh, springtime is a cool time uh, because we, uh, we get to see new things. Grass starts getting green, flowers start popping. You get to remind it of the grace and the love of Christ in, in creation and how, you know, wintertime seems like it takes forever sometimes. Yet when spring comes, man, we know that God loves us. Lots of great things to see. I even enjoy getting on the mower and riding the mower for a while. Somebody say amen. Gives you a little peace. The hum of that motor kind of lets you focus, slow down a little bit. Uh, this morning, I'm continuing in our series in First Peter, and actually there's just one more, ser- one more message that we're going to preach on that uh, after stewardship uh, next month. So uh, we're going to be closing this series out. Last week, we talked about suffering and the idea of suffering, and of, I was kind of surprised when I uh, looked on Facebook and I saw that that sermon actually had performed better than 95% of all the other sermons that I had preached and put on Facebook. So I'm not sure why, because I didn't think it was all that good. In fact, I told Mary when I went home, I thought, that just didn't, that just didn't really feel like it resonated with people, but I guess it did. The idea of suffering... Most of us can identify to that, what that looks like, how it feels, uh, where we have struggled in suffering. Just had a long chat with someone this morning about the idea of suffering and what that looks like for people. And, and I guess for me, the conclusion to that really is this. There, there's really all kinds of suffering, and it's clear that the Word of God tells us that there are times when God actually plans suffering to somehow get our attention, but we must understand that suffering is the result of one thing, sin. And you must come to terms with the idea that that's where suffering has its root, in sin. Not sins, not the little sins or the little miscues or the little things that I do, but the very essence of sin from Genesis chapter 3 where the, where the, the Lord gave people instruction and they rebelled. Well, that's sin. And so sometimes, oftentimes, suffering is a result of my sin, someone else's sin, the rebellion in my life, so on and so forth. From suffering today, we're going to move into living. Somebody say amen. That God actually has word for us about living. What does it look like to live for God, to live in Him, to have this place in Him where living is my focus. How many of you want to live for God? If you want to live for God, then this message is going to be powerful for you today because Peter plays out for us, gives us some really important things to help us understand how to live for God. But I'm confident as well that just like suffering may have been, you may hear some things today that might be a bit of a challenge for us. One of the things that we struggle with in the church, especially in the church in general in America today, is what I would call the difference between a biblical worldview and a cultural worldview. And it is distinctly different. And many times we, the church, have far more adopted the worldview of the world and not the worldview of the Bible. And there's where the rubber meets the road for us. There's where conflict happens in our life because we have adopted more of the principles of this world than the principles of Scripture. We, we know that today, I mean, and I, I invite you to pray for the churches in our country, the Christian, quote, Christian Bible-believing churches in our country. Today, I, this past week, I received an article from the ADF, American Defense Fund, where a pastor in Georgia was fired Monday morning for a sermon he preached Sunday morning. He showed up to work on Monday morning. He's a part, he's a by, by he, he works in and also pastors. He showed up to work Monday morning and the sermon that he preached on Sunday morning, his boss called him into the office and fired him on the spot. There is a conflict between the cultural worldview and biblical worldview. Somebody say Amen.
Folks, it is, we are in the middle of that in this country. You cannot avoid it. I promise you this much. Living for God is going to be choosing God over this world. And every one of us will have to face that choice. If you're alive today, I believe that you may actually, by your government, be required to make a choice between serving God and serving the world. Are you ready to make that choice? Are you ready to abandon the world for Christ? I confess, I understand that's a challenging place, isn't it? Because so often we have inundated the church with the principles of the world instead of inundating the world with the principles of the church. Somebody say amen. We've allowed those principles to come into the church. Living for God. Peter uh, writes to us, starting in verse 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. If you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The first point this morning is simply living through attitude and lifestyle. And I would ask you right off the bat to ask you to just check yourself, what is my attitude towards God? What is my attitude towards God? How do I see God? How do I approach God? How do I talk to God? How do I live with God? What is my attitude when it comes to God and godly things? Godly lifestyles? Godly positions? Godly decisions? What is my attitude towards God? Peter connects that attitude with the very suffering of Christ. And so if you have already suffered for Christ, you are beginning to understand and identify with Christ. And so what is your attitude towards that? Are you willing to suffer for Christ? Are you willing to be set aside, pointed out, picked on, abused for Jesus? Are you willing for people to misunderstand you, say wrong things about you, misinterpret you? For Jesus. Because if you are, then you are living like Christ, and that is his attitude. See, Christ was completely misunderstood. He was completely, he was, everybody around him under, misunderstood him, except for just a few people. Everybody misunderstood what he was about. They had all kinds of things to say about him. Very few of them were very nice. Somebody say amen. Amen. Even to the point of, of crucifying him. One of the most poignant statements for me in the, in the crucifixion is where the, the people, he's been, Christ has been crucified and he's hanging on the cross and there, somebody in the crowd says, well, he believed in God, now let's see him do, take himself from the cross. How sarcastic. That someone in the crowd actually had enough gumption To pass judgment on Christ. Somebody say amen. They were that confused. Peter challenges us to live through attitude and lifestyle. In other words, there should be a difference in my attitude than everyone else's attitude. Except for believers. My lifestyle should be a reflection of having experienced Christ. Having walked with Christ. Living with Christ. Having met Christ, my lifestyle should reflect that. What does that look like? 
Will you, will you agree with me this morning that for many years now here, we have created what I would like to call the gray area of Christ in our lifestyles. We've kind of crossed the line. We've kind of mixed it up based upon personal theology or personal ideas or personal viewpoints or personal values. We've mixed it up. And we've somehow created this gray area where certain things have now become acceptable in my lifestyle and still following Christ. All based upon my opinion or what I feel like or how I want to interpret the Scripture. So I want to be clear today at what Peter is saying. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, debauchery, Debauchery is not a very good word. Debauchery basically means living like the world or your life lining up with the world, living the same as the world. The world lives in debauchery. We see it every day. I mean, you could could watch TV if you wanted to for just a few minutes and see that. Somebody say amen. I mean, only if you just watch TV commercials, you could say that, right? Right? the presentation of debauchery or this lascivious lifestyle that anything goes. There are no boundaries. There's nothing that keeps me hemmed in. Lust. I could preach on that for the rest of the day, but I'll just kind of slide over that because I don't think we need any definition on lust. Somebody say amen. We all understand what that looks like, right? The one I've been most surprised with is a Hardee's commercial. Somebody say amen. I mean, wow. Just wow. For a hamburger? I think Hardy's ought to go back to being Sandy. Somebody say amen. Drunkenness. Orgies. Carousing. That's the world. Idolatry. That's what the world does. We have been delivered from that through Christ. I heard someone say once some time ago that when you're out in public, you can't really tell the difference between those who are following Christ and those who are not. They look the same. They sound the same. They're doing the same things. Do you know that in, in this world today, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or an unbeliever Divorce in the church is 60%, which is exactly the same as that in the world. Abortion, the rate of abortion is exactly the same of people in the church as people outside the church. Peter challenges us to take a look at our attitude and our lifestyle. And ask ourselves, am I lining up with Scripture? Am I lining up with what has been done for me according to the Spirit? I love the last three words. God, in regard to the Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit of God saying to you today about your attitude and your lifestyle? Second point this morning. Living through prayer and love. Verses 7 through 9. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. So that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Be alert and of sober mind so that you can pray. What is prayer? Prayer is my time communicating with my Father 
through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. That's what prayer is. Don't raise your hands when I ask this, ask this question, but how many of you this week spent at least one hour praying? Communicating with your God. Just talking to Him, letting Him talk to you. I believe the first battlefield for us as Christians is the principle and the discipline of prayer. And yet it's oftentimes the first thing that goes away. It's the first thing we take off the list. Because we are, say it with me, busy. We have so many things going on that we can't even dedicate a few minutes a day for prayer. It is our weakness. As a church in general across the United States, it is absolutely our weakness. Our lack of prayer is our weakness. And because we do not pray, we also do not love. Prayer and love are put together. You cannot love adequately without prayer. Because when you are praying, you are coming face to face with your relationship with Christ. And when you are praying in relationship to Christ, He will show you how to love. Without that prayer, you don't really know how to love the way He wants you to love. You don't really understand. And you will pray in your, you will love only in your strength. You will love in your worldview, not in the biblical view. You will love not like Christ loves, but you will love as the way the world loves. And so without prayer, can we really love? I think Peter purposely puts these two together so that we can understand that prayer is the guiding thing that causes me to love. To love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. How many of you are holding a grudge against someone today? How many of you are mad at someone today? Someone even in the church or even a past church experience. Have you been able to forgive them? Are you able to be free from them? Because that's how Christ loved, right? Christ loved us so much that he did what? Forgave our sin past, forgave our sin present, forgave our sin in the future. We are completely forgiven and restored by His grace. That's how Christ loved us. That's how Christ calls us to love others, past, present, and future. Well, I know that they'll do that again. How many of you have repeated a sin in your own life more than 10 times? How about 20 times? about 50 times? How about every stinking day? And every time I go to Christ, I receive what? Do I give that same to everybody else? Do I love people like that? I can promise you this, you won't unless you're praying. Because when you pray, Jesus brings that mirror right up in front of you and he says, uh -uh. Here's what you need to deal today. Have you forgiven this person? Have you released this person or persons? This one right here. This, this, uh, uh, see, when I look in the mirror, I don't actually see me. I see the people I need to deal with. So we don't pray because we don't really want to know. Or we don't like the receive what we we don't like what we get when we pray. Somebody say amen. See, if I want to be in communion with Christ in prayer, then I have to come to Him with a pure heart, a heart that's been healed, a heart that's been set free, a heart that is not bound up in the things of this world. And so, if I'm coming with a heart that's bound up with the things of this world, He's going to show me where I need to do some work because He's my. Good, good father. 
because he loves me so much as my good, good father, he's going to bring discipline and correction into my life as his child. He's going to expose to me. He's going to show me what I need to do. Well, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to have to do that. I know. None of us do. You know why we don't? Because of sin. Because going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, God said, you can have everything in this garden but that tree. And Adam and Eve said, no, I'm taking that tree. It's called rebellion. God says, you can have everything but. And we say, okay, I'm going to choose the but. So I live through prayer. I live through my love for other people. I live an attitude of lifestyle of Christ. That's what living for God is. And my attitude, my lifestyle begins to line up with Christ. Folks, I promise you this. If you're going to follow Christ, it's not always going to be easy. In fact, I will tell you it's going to be hard a lot, especially in this world today, especially if you're going to have a true biblical worldview living today in the 21st century. It's not going to be easy. People are going to throw that stuff. They're going to heap abuse on you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to make fun of you because you don't join in with them doing their things. living their lifestyle. You choose Christ. Lastly this morning, living through service. And I have some really important things I want to say here this morning, so I hope that you will just kind of hear me through here. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 through 11. Each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. First and foremost, the gift you have received. I want you to understand, first and foremost, when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you received gifts. You were created with gifts, and those gifts were meant for serving. First point, be really clear. As faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms, if anyone speaks, they should do so of one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Christians live through service. Why do we live through service? Because we have first been served. If you want a great example of this, go to John chapter 13. Jesus says, in the full extent of his love, he served. What did he do? He took the lowest position of the day which was the position of the slave of picking up a basin of water and washing his disciples' filthy, dirty feet. That's the life. Serving. We live in a culture today that people go to church so that they can be served. They go to church so that the pastor will give them a great message so they will be served. They show up on Sunday so that someone will serve them. They want to be served. They don't want to serve. And yet to live through God and living for God is to be a servant. I live through the service that I give because I have been served already. When I came to Christ, I came to that cross. I came to this moment of understanding that I needed Christ. And I looked up to the cross and Christ is hanging on the cross and his blood is coming down the cross and he has washed away my sin. I am now clean. I am white as snow. I have been preserved. I have been sanctified. I have been justified. I have been redeemed because I have been served. 
I now become a servant. First, a servant of Christ. Second, a service of everybody else. Well, I only want to serve these people. I only want to serve this. I only want to serve here. I only want to serve there. I live through service. Because I've been served. That's how I live. My service becomes the example of being served, of my life being changed. Well, I'm so busy, Pastor Marty, I can't serve. Just say this with me. We are all too busy. Can we agree to that this morning? You know a, a word that will help you stop being so busy? No. No, I can't do that. No, I won't do that. No, that does not line up with the will of God for my life. No. It's really a simple word, but it's really hard to say, isn't it? No, Pastor Marty, I can't do that. Okay. No, whoever. Many of us, I believe, live in what I want, a, a, a term that I'm going to give you this morning, and this has just been refreshed in me this week. It's been something that's been working in my life, and probably maybe even some things that you have seen me do differently are because of this term. And the term is enmeshment. And enmeshment simply is this. A person who is involved in enmeshment, enmeshment, E-N-M-E-S-H-M-E-N-T, basically allows other people to determine for them what it is that they're going to do. Somebody say amen. And many times it's accompanied by guilt, manipulation, and a sense of false responsibility. In other words, because so-and-so family always does it on so-and-so time at so-and-so place, this is what we will always do. Somebody say amen. That's called enmeshment. So here I can prove to you this morning that you are already dealing with enmeshment. Because you probably have somebody in your family that tells you, this is the way we do it, this is how we do it, and this is the day we do it on. If you don't show it up, you're wrong and you should be here. Don't you love us enough to be here? Don't you care about us enough to be here? How come you're not here? That's not service, that's slavery. Somebody say amen. There's a big difference between service and slavery. Big difference. One of our sessions on this week in the conference that I went to online, technology is amazing things. Some of us this week went to a uh, emotionally healthy spirituality conference in New York City in the foyer. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Expectations. Enmeshment. That's slavery, that's not service. I serve because I have been served. I serve the way Jesus served because Jesus first served me. I serve because I want to serve. I serve because I love to serve. I serve because I love the people so much that I'm going to serve. I serve because it's inside of me and it can't hardly, hardly contain itself. It has to get out. I don't serve under guilt and manipulation and false responsibility. I serve because I love Christ and because he loves me. And I want somebody else to know the love of Christ. And if it's my service that brings them to Christ, hallelujah. And if it's not, I'll just bless them anyway. Amen. 
That's living for God. That's what living for God is. My life given up for Him. My life given up for Him to bless them. That's what service is. So I'm going to set a boundary here today. You know, I don't want to ever force anybody in this church to serve. I want you to serve because you have the right attitude. I want you to serve because you love Christ. I don't want you ever, I don't want anybody in this church to ever serve again because they feel like they're being guilted or manipulated into serving. Nobody. I'll even open that door even farther. If you're serving right now in a place and you're only doing that out of guilt and manipulation, I want you to stop now. Because you're not getting blessed and they're not getting blessed. It's not the way Christ wants to do it. It's serving with strings. I don't want you to serve with strings. I want you to let it go. And if that means, well, some things are going to stop happening around here, well, some things are going to stop happening around here. Because here's what I'm going to promise you. I'm not going to pick them all up. So if you're not, if you're serving for the wrong reasons, I want you to stop. If you're not serving because you're looking to the cross and Jesus is there and you've been served, or if you're serving out of a sense of duty or guilt or manipulation, I ask you to stop today. Because that's not what the Lord wants. And you're not getting anything out of it and the people you're serving are not getting anything out of it either. Just stop. Living through my attitude and my lifestyle. Living through prayer and love. Living through service. F five cool, very cool, very clear things where Peter writes to us and says, challenges us in a New Testament belief, in a New Testament system, in a modern day context, this is what it should look like. This is how we should live. This is the format. This is how you can know that you're doing something accurately for Christ. If your attitude is right, if your lifestyle is right, if your prayer life is awesome, if you're loving people, and if you're serving people, then you're right in line with Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. That's what it looks like this morning for you. That's what it looks like. I invite you to bow your heads. As you consider what we've shared here this morning, what, what is the evaluation that you would make of your life? If you were giving yourself a, a 10 as the highest you could get on these things, or if you're giving yourself a zero, which would it be? Which would it be? Maybe somewhere in the middle. I don't know. Evaluate your own life this morning. Don't let me evaluate it for you. Evaluate your own life. How are you serving? Are you serving with strings? Are you serving like I'm serving here because I need to get something done some other place so I'm going to do this to somehow earn some place of, 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 some place of influence, some place of position? Or am I serving just because Jesus served me? What changes are you going to make? What changes is the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart right now? What is he saying to you? Are you learning here to learn or are you learning here to apply? To begin to apply into your life the very principles that Peter has given to us here this morning about my life. Do I often get caught in my lifestyle with other people? Do I get caught in the trap of my lifestyle? If I'm around other people and they're living like the world lives, am I caught into that? And can I, can I, can I be there in a healthy way? Or do I need to set some boundaries in this life? So I can be a light. What does that look like for you personally today? How does it apply for you personally today? And what are you going to do with that? 
As the worship team comes this morning, we're going to begin with some music. But I want to ask one more question this morning. As they come, are you living your attitude and your lifestyle and your prayer and your love and your service from a cultural worldview? Or are you living that from a biblical worldview? Are you, is your life more absorbed by the way the culture thinks things should happen? Or is it absorbed by the way the Bible thinks things should happen? And I confess to you this morning that maybe some of us here in this room have never heard that like that before. Because we're so gray. Sometimes we are so gray in the church today that we, we're not sure where the defining lines are, where the, whether we're a part of the church or we're, we're part of the world or if whether all of this is like jumbled up, mixed up together in one big pot and everything or anything goes. Well, I can promise you folks, in the kingdom of God, not everything and anything goes. And I know that that's not a culturally very tolerant thing to say. But not everything goes in the kingdom of God. It's not just anything I want in the kingdom of God. It's not just the way I feel it should be or the way I want it to be or the way I define it to be or the way I want to interpret it or the way I don't want to interpret it or what I believe Pastor Marnie's saying or what I don't believe Pastor Marnie's saying or whatever somebody else is saying. It's the way God says it. That's the way it is. It's the way God says it in His Word. And it does not, and it is not, open for interpretation by every individual in the world. It's His standard. And this is His Word that we heard today. The Word of the one true God, the good, good Father, who loves me so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die for me, to cover my sin to set me free so that I could live with a great attitude, so I could live with a lifestyle that reflects Him, so I could live in prayer and communion with Him, so I could live loving other people, so that I could live serving because He first served me. He first served me. Today, if you don't know this Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, I invite you to check your heart, examine your heart, ask yourself this question today. If you were to die tomorrow, would you be going to heaven? Would you go and be with Jesus? Or would you stand before the Lord with all kinds of excuses because of some cultural worldview because of the way you thought it was? That was never true. That was always a lie. Which way would it be? If you want to accept Jesus today, I invite you to open your heart to him. And while the music begins, when the music begins and people begin to minister to each other or go to the Lord for ministry, if you want to accept Jesus, I invite you to come up here to my right, your left, and we will do what we need to do in the presence of the Lord. Lifestyle, attitude, living for God. The world needs to see people who are going to live for God, even through suffering, even through challenging, maybe even through death. That no matter what may come, no matter what may happen, we're going to live for God. We're going to live for Him. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your word from 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 your disciple Peter. I thank you for sharing that with us today and drawing us into this relationship where you... Uh, want to have an impact in our lives. I pray that today this word would uh, settle into people's hearts, that there would be a sense of peace and joy, a sense of resting in you, knowing you, uh, receiving from you. But I also pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, that you, would, that you would just prompt our hearts to do whatever it is that we need to do to apply what has been learned. Not just to learn to learn just to receive another sermon and I go on about my way, do my thing the way I've always done it but instead that I could see where there's a point for repentance, there's a point for change, there's a point for transformation, there's a point where I'm going to do something different starting today and that you would give us the courage, Lord, to respond to you and to your leading and to your Holy Spirit 
in whatever, whatever that may be. We love you, Jesus. Amen.